Okay, hi. So um, today I'll be talking about um, a beginner's guide to compilers. Um, so two years ago, I was looking for a C++ project to help, to help me enhance my C++ skills. So um, my mentor said, um, why don't you write a simple compiler? And I was like, me, write a compiler. A compiler is too huge. But yeah, and um, I completed um, the project. I think earlier this year, I wrote a simple expressions only compiler. So my goal for this talk today is to um, spark your curiosity about the inner workings of a compiler and also inspire you to delve deeper to and research on your own on how compilers work. So this is basically a beginner's friendly guide to compilers. Um, a bit about me, my name is Jennifer. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I love adventures, I love yoga, and um, I am obsessed with C++. Yeah, I know, I know people say, I don't like the language, like the programming um, basics and all of that, but yeah, I love C++ and I'm sorry about that. I'm obsessed with C++. So, and I also enjoy African fiction novels a lot. So I'll talk today, we are going to be talking about compilers, the stages of um, compilation in a beginner friendly manner. So um, it doesn't matter whether you know what compilers are, if you worked with them, I mean, as a programmer, def definitely you worked with compilers before, but probably you don't know that that's what a compiler is. So this talk will give you to the basics of how a compiler works. So first off, what are compilers? I would say a compiler is basically like a translator not just any translator, a one-way translator is a tool that helps you translate um, from human readable source code into machine understandable codes or instructions. And it's one way. You can translate your source code to um, a machine code, but you can translate your machine code back to a source code using the compiler. So um, in this talk, I'll be using the food analogy. So basically a compiler is like cooking. It's like turning raw ingredients to delicious meal. Or you can turn your meal back to raw ingredients. So yeah, it's kind of a one-way translator. So um, as um, a developer, why should you care about compilers? Why should you care about knowing the inner workings of a compiler? Yeah, so basically the first step is um, knowing about compilers help you understand errors better. Like I said about cooking, let's imagine you're a chef and um, you have a supervisor and you're cooking in the kitchen. And the supervisor comes in and tastes the food and says, oh my God, um, yeah, Jennifer, this food is too salty. So um, immediately you know, okay, this food is too salty. I have to figure out a way to make it less salty. Yeah, so but what if um, your supervisor comes in and says, oh, oh my God, this, balance, um, this flavor balance of this food is off. I mean, I'll be confused. What does it mean? Does it mean it's too sweet? Does it mean the food is too sour? Does it mean the food is too salty? What does it mean by the flavor balance is off? But if you're um, an experienced chef that has been cooking for a long time, cooking, not just cooking any meal, cooking this particular meal for a long time, when your supervisor says the flavor balance is off, you would know what he means by the flavor balance is off because I mean, you've been doing this for a long time and you know the process of cooking and the steps it takes to make this particular meal. So yeah, knowing about compilers will help you understand a lot of ambiguous errors in your code better. And also, um, Knowing the in-depth of how compilers work helps you um, demystify the process of code to execution. Most of us, we just, uh, let's say we have a Python program, hello world, we just click it and it runs and you don't really know what happens deep down. How did the hello world translate and print out hello world? So knowing how compilers work will help demystify this process and it will help you appreciate programming more. I mean, if you know the process or the, um, the effort it takes for a chef to make a particular meal good, nice, it helps you appreciate that food more. And also we have, um, knowing about compilers will also help you make, uh, make informed use of language and tools. Again, you're a chef. If you know how to make this meal, you will know when to bake, when to fry, um, when to use um, a non-stick pot, when to use a wooden spoon because you have experience in cooking. So um, if you know how compilers work, you know when to use what, when, to, when should I use um, Python? When should I use C++? When should I use JavaScript? Or when should I use this particular library? Or when should I not use this particular library? 
knowing the inner workings of, of compilers help you make the decisions. And making the decisions will also help you write a more effective and maintainable code. And then um, the first reason why you should know how compilers work is it helps you enhance your debugging skills. Again, um, your supervisor said the flavor balance is off and you've tasted the food and it was sour. If you're new to cooking, you definitely not know the ingredients that you put, put that made it sour. Was it the onion? Was it the um, garlic? Was it, was it the ginger? You won't know. But um, as an experienced seasoned chef, you would know, okay, ah, it was because I put the ginger before the garlic. It was because I put the garlic before the ginger. That's why, because ginger has these properties and it tends to make things sour. Or garlic make, has these properties and it tends to make things sour. So knowing the in-depth of the process of cooking would help you figure out, oh, okay, this is what I did wrong. And next time I wouldn't do this or to fix it, I'm going to do this. So yeah, knowing about compilers would help enhance your debugging skills when programming. Knowing about compilers will also help you optimize code for better performance. Again, again as a chef, um, you're trying to follow a recipe and it says um, fresh tomatoes and you don't have fresh tomatoes. If you're good, if you're a, like a seasoned chef, you should know, okay, I can actually um, um, get um, something else to use um, to cook instead of, since I don't have access to fresh tomatoes, you can make better decisions. So knowing how compilers work, would help you um, optimize your code better. OK, um, sometimes compilers and interpreters get exchanged, especially for beginners. Um, these two uh, paradigms are, are things that find, OK, for me, when I started writing compilers, I found it difficult to find out what's the difference between a compiler and an interpreter. What makes them so different? different? What makes Python different from C++? When people say, ah, Python is slow and C++ is faster. Why? Why is C++ faster than Python? And why is Python slower? Or why is JavaScript different? So um, the reason is because some languages are compiled languages and some languages are interpreted. And there are differences between a compiler and an interpreter. One is that a compiler translates the entire source code all at once, while interpreters entire, um, translate the source code line by line. So it goes through the source code line by line, while compilers just bundle everything at once and um, translate them. So it's like you have a translator, and then when you speak um, one sentence, he translates it. You speak the next sentence, he translates it. That's what an interpreter does. But for a compiler, the compiler waits for you to finish your whole statement and it translates all the statements to the next person. Also, compilers produce an executable file. Why interpreters don't do that? Compilers, again, detect errors on full scan. Why interpreters detect errors line by line? Because they are translating the code line by line. Let's say, for example, you have um, a program and in that program, that program has 10 lines of code, yeah? And um, in that 10 lines of code, there's an error on line two and there's an error on line 10. For a compiler, a compiler would read the whole 10 lines of code and tell you that, oh, there's an error in line two and line 10, but an interpreter is different. It will read the first two lines and tell you, oh, there's an error in line two, and then you go on to fix the error in line two. Then you read the next lines again. When you get to line eight, it tells you, oh, there's another error actually in line, line eight. Then you go to fix the error in line eight. So it reads the codes line by line Why compilers bundle everything up. Um, in compilers, execution is separate for, from compilation. The fact that you've compiled your program doesn't mean it's executable. There are also other processes after compilation to turn the program into an executable. Why interpreters execution happens immediately. So um, languages that are compiled, example of languages that are compiled are C++, Rust, and Golang. Why examples of interpreted languages are Python, Ruby, and PHP. Yeah. So um, the roadmap to writing your own compiler or the roadmap to knowing how a compiler works. In a compiler, there are four stages. 
So the first stage in compilation is the lexical analysis. In the lexical analysis, the lexical analysis takes the source code and um, print outs and outputs called tokens. And those tokens are then taken as the inputs of the next step. The next step is called either a parser or syntax analysis. It basically means the same thing. So it takes the outputs of the lexical analyzer, which is tokens, and passes it into the parser or the syntax analysis. And this uh, analyzes the syntax of the tokens and then outputs an abstract syntax tree. And this abstract syntax tree is passed to the next stage, which is um, semantic analysis. And the output is an intermediate representation. And then um, this output is also passed to the final stage, the code generation, which then outputs the assembly code or the machine code. So we are going to dive into these stages one by one. To, um, so I'm going to be explaining how these stages work, what they do, and um, each job during the compilation process. So um, the first stage of compilation is the lexical analyzer. And a lexical analyzer, all it does is it reads the source code and then converts it into series of tokens. Um, for example, here we have x equal to 2 plus 8. Once it passes through the, um, the lexa, its outputs are um, 5 tokens equal to 2x plus an 8. So it's like breaking things down into chunks. So the lexa has three jobs. It breaks this, um, your code down into chunks and classifies them. Like here, we have x equals to 2 plus 8. After breaking it down, it says, OK, this is an equal to sign. This is a 2. A 2 is a literal. This is x. x is a, var a variable. This plus plus is an operator. So, um, so there are different types of, according to your programming language, you can have any type of token is up to you. You can write your own um, compiler and have different types of tokens. So what the laser does is to classify these tokens according to what kind they are. They can be literals, they can be operators, they can just be symbols, they can be keywords like if, else, they can be identifiers like a variable name or a function name. So its first job is to classify and then it detects invalid tokens. Let's, um, let's I'm, Going to use Python as, a, as an example. If you're writing a Python code and um, you impute the dollar sign, the dollar sign is a valid token in Python in Python code. So it's going to throw an error saying this token is invalid. So that's the job of the lexa. The job of the lexa is to identify which tokens are valid and which tokens are invalid. And if there's an invalid token, it throws an error. Also, another job of the compiler of the lexa is removing unnecessary details. Things like comments in your code and um, spaces. Those are unnecessary details that you don't really need during compilation. So the job of the lexa is to remove these unnecessary details. Again, in summary, the job of the lexa is just to make sure that your code contains valid tokens. And those tokens are basically um, a representation of the code's fundamental elements. Again, you can write your programming language and define the dollar sign as a, a valid token and write your lexa to identify um, a dollar sign as a valid token. It's acceptable. I mean, it's your language, you can do whatever you want to do with it. So the job, job of the lexa is to make sure that it's passing valid tokens into the next stage of compilation. So the next stage of compilation is um, the syntax analyzer or syntax analysis, also called parser. So this stage determines whether the sequence of tokens that have been passed by the lexa is a valid program according to your language's grammar. Every language has a grammar or um, language grammar is basically rules that's, that um, a language, structural rules that a language follows. Let's say, for example, in mathematics, we have board mass. That's um, B O D M A S. That's what the rule in mathematics. And when you don't follow that rule in mathematics, no matter the answer you get, it's definitely going to be wrong because you didn't follow the board mass rules. Same with programming. There are rules that guide different programming languages. For example, after an if, there should be a conditional statement, right? Those are, this is one of the rules that guide a programming language. After an equal to sign, there should be a literal or 
an um, identifier after an equal sign. You can't just have x equal to. That's not a valid um, code. So the job of the syntax ana analyzer is to make sure that you're following the exact structure that um, the, uh, the you are following the exact structure of the programming language. So let's say, for example, you have if x plus two. If x plus two, when it goes through the lexical analyzer, um, these are valid token. If it's a keyword, it's valid. Opening bracket is a symbol, is valid. X is a literal. Oh, sorry, x is an identifier, is valid. Plus is an operator. Two is a literal, and you have also have your symbol, the closing bracket. So this will pass from the from the lexical anal analyzer. This will pass because all these tokens are valid tokens in a program. But when it comes to the syntax an analyzer, the syntax analyzer will see, oh, okay, you have an if statement. But after this if, you don't have a condition. You have a statement instead of conditions. Those are not the rules here. The rule here states that after an if statement, you should have a condition, not a statement. So it throws an error saying no. After an if statement, there should be a condition. So this type of errors are thrown in the syntax analysis stage of the compiler. Also, the syntax analysis um, also checks. Let's say um, you have, I have an example here, if open bracket x plus two. If I don't have um, the closing bracket to um, complement the opening bracket, the syntax analyzer will also throw an error saying um, you don't have an, a closing bracket to complement an opening bracket. bracket. So what it just does is um, structural analysis of your code. Is this code following the rules that has been set by this programming language? to um, run this code. Now, after that, what the syntax analysis does is to arrange those tokens in a tree-like structure. This tree is called an EST, an abstract syntax tree. And this, it does this because um, it helps show the relationship between the tokens. Like we have here, the example we had before, x equal to 2 plus 8. This is what the AST would look like. This is what the AST would look like visually. It's just a tree that shows how the tokens are related to each other. So after this stage, we have the semantic analysis stage. I mean, you have your valid tokens and your structure is correct. But that doesn't mean your program actually makes any sense. Let me use an example. I have this word here, cheers fly happily. Let's say we, are, we, are, we have an English compiler. Chairs fly happily, passing through the Lexa. These are all English words and they are spelled correctly. So the Lexa will say, oh, this sentence is good to go because every word in this sentence is spelled correctly and every word in this sentence is also an English word. Then it passes it to the syntax analyzer. When the syntax analyzer sees chairs fly happily, it will say, oh, okay, chair is a subject, fly is a verb, and happily is an adverb. So this is a good English sentence. I mean, structurally, this has subject, it has, it has a verb, and it has an adverb. So this English sentence looks good structurally to me. Then it passes it to the semantic analyzer. And the semantic analyzer looks at it and says, chairs fly happily. Chairs fly happily, yes, is correct, but it's meaningless. Chairs can't fly, and they don't have emotions to be happy. I mean, yes, structurally, it's correct. The tokens are valid, but it doesn't make any sense. It's, to a meaningless sentence. So this is the job of the semantic analysis. It validates the meaning of the code. Does this code has, have a meaning or not? So um, when we say, does this code have a meaning or not? Um, sem in semantic analysis stage, this is a stage where you can catch errors like undeclared variables. For example, um, okay, okay, we can catch um, errors like undeclared variables. For example, we can have x equal to two plus a. This would pass through the lexical analysis stage and also pass through the syntax analysis stage. But when it comes to the semantic analysis stage, we see that, oh, the A variable was never defined. But then how does semantic analysis know that a variable has been declined before or, um, defined before or not? It uses something called symbol tables. It uses this table to keep track of every variable that you've been defining in your program. It keeps track of the name of the variable, you can name your variable anything. The type, is it an integer? Is it a float? Is it a string? Then it keeps track of the value. 
and it also keeps track of it, the scope. Is it a global variable or was it declared inside a function? So because um, the scope of the variable will help tell the systematic analyzer when this variable dies off in this program. So um, the semantic analysis stage is a stage where the compiler catches undeclared variables by checking its symbol table to see, oh, has this variable been declared before? It says yes or no. Then the semantic analysis also catches a type of error called type mismatch. This type mismatch, it depends on how you want to structure your programming language. There are statically and dynamically typed programming languages. For example, we have the example int number equal to two. If this is a C++ program where you've defined number to be an integer. Number, a variable is like a container and you said, okay, this container only contains integers and you've assigned it to two. And then next you come and say, oh, I don't want two to be in this container again. I want five to be in this container. Then you move it and put it. The container will be like, okay, yeah, it's fine. Five is still an integer, I can take it. Then next you come and remove five and say, no, I want to put a string in this container. The compiler will complain and say, no, you said this, this container is for integers alone and not um, any other type. It's just for integers alone. So this type of um, rules in a programming language are called statically typed programming language, where um, um, type com uh, a type holds a particular uh, a, va a variable holds a particular type and cannot be changed. So if you're writing a statically typed programming language, the semantic analysis will be able to catch type mismatches in this case. But sometimes your programming language can be dynamic. Like, like this example we have here, var value. I think this is a JavaScript program where you have a variable value assigned to two. I mean, you can come in and say, oh, I don't want this to be two again, just put in a string here and the code runs. So this is a dynamically typed um, programming language. So in this case, the semantic analysis won't complain because you've already defined your programming language to be dynamically typed. Then multiple declarations also. There can be multiple declarations of, um, depending on how you want to write your programming language, it's your word. I mean, you define anything you want to define. So you are like the creator here, so you can do anything you want to do. So depending on how you want your programming language to be, the rules you've put, the semantic analysis will be able to catch these errors. For example, too, we have the scope violation error. Let's say you have um, a variable defined inside the function, and then you come back and want to use that variable outside of the function. With the help of um, symbol tables, the semantic analyzer will be able to say, oh, okay, no, 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 no. This variable has already died when this function call ended. So you can't actually use this variable again. If you want to use it, you have to define it where you are. So yeah, it helps. Um, these are the type of errors that the semantic analyzer catches. So we've talked about the Lexa, We've talked about the syntax analyzer, and we've talked about the semantic analysis. So what would be the output of the semantic analysis? Remember, semantic analysis took the tree, the tree-like structure from the syntax analyzer. So now what would be the output of this semantic analysis? The output will still be a tree, but this time around is an annotated tree because these trees now have details. They don't just have the tokens, they have their details, the details of these tokens. Oh, okay, it has details like the scope of this token, the type and the value of this particular token. So the output of a semantic anal analyzer is still a tree, but a tree with details. So the next stage after, um, the semantic analysis and this is the final stage this is the code generation to me um this was the most challenging stage when i was writing my compiler because trying to understand assembly code how it works how registers works was kind of a hassle for me but um this would be an introductory to code generation so again the, the annotated tree from the semantic anal analyzer is also called intermediate representation because, I mean, anybody can 
I can say, okay, the details I want for my um, for my tree, the details I want, I just want the type details to be there. And that person will say, oh, no, 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 no. I want my trees to have type details and I also want it to have um, the location of each and every variable. Is this variable in line two? Is this variable in line, line five? What, where is this variable located? So it's up to you to define how you want your um, intermediate representation or the annotated ASC trees to be. Then um, after that, we have the code generation. The tree is passed to the code generation stage. So this stage is a final stage that outputs the target code or the machine code. Now, um, just like we all speak different languages, computers also speak different languages based, based on their architecture. You can have an ARM um, architecture, you can have x86, you can have MIPS, you can have WASAM. Then um, based on these architectures, we define how your machine code would actually be. So yeah, um, the machine code differs. So when you're writing the compiler, you're compiling from your target source code to, your, to a machine code. You have to first figure out what kind of machine am I trying to target? Am I going to target a PC like S86? Most PCs also use ARM. Or am I going to target um, a MIPS? Or what exactly, what target architecture am I going to target for my code to run? So, um, to generate this code generation, the code generation uses registers to generate its code. Registers are like um, a tiny storage in the CPU that are very, very fast. You can say registers are just like variables. The way we have our variables, x equal to two. Registers are like variables. But the only problem with registers is they are limited. Each architecture has a specific amount of registers. And some architectures can actually say, oh, we have 10 registers, but five are used for integers and float, and the remaining five are used for floats. Another will say, no, I have 20 um, registers. So depending on the architecture you want to target, that will determine the amount of registers you will have. So unlike a variable that you can just create variable out of the blues, registers are not like that. So you have to be careful when you're doing your code generation to be able to optimize your um, registers quickly. You don't just assign registers um, to your code anyhow because it's limited. So you have to be very careful when you're doing that. And when you're done with a, a, a particular register, you keep it so that you can use it next time. So, um, so still with our example, x plus two plus, x equal to two plus eight. This is what the code generation output for ARM would look like. So I know that this is would be a bit complicated, but yeah, uh, the goal of this uh, this talk is to spark your curiosity. So I think this will do it. So you have x equal to two plus eight, and this is what the ARM code generation generation looks like. What it does is it loads two into register R zero, it loads um, eight into register R one, then it adds the value of register R zero and R one and stores the value into register R0. You see how it did not store the value into register R2? No, it reused the, the, um, the register it has used before because it knows, oh, I don't actually need this literally again. Um, I don't need this um, literally again. So what's the point of still keeping it into in R0? So it has the value in R0 and R1 and then saves it back in R0. And then it stores the, the result of R0 inside R0 again. So what you have to be careful when you're doing the code generation because, like I said, you have a limited value of CPU and you're trying to optimize the way you use the CPU. Sometimes um, the optimization doesn't work. I mean, you just have limited value of CPUs. When this doesn't work, the um, code generation does something called spilling. What it does is that it moves some values from the registers to the main memory. But the, but the, um, the trade-off of this is that registers are very, very fast. Registers are just like um, a, a pocket in your trouser that you can just pull out. But memory is basically like going to a drawer to pull out something. The time it should take for you to walk to the drawer and pull it out versus putting your hand in your pocket to bring out something. So registers are pretty fast. 
But then in a case where you've optimized and optimized, but registers are not just enough, you are going to spill some of your values into the main memory, into the memory. And then when you need them, you can assess them later. But the trade-off is the speed. Yeah. So um okay, I have an expressions only compiler because I mean this is an introductory to compiler. So it handles just expressions, um, expressions like um, operators like plus, minus, divide, and variables, and the print functions too. So this code is available for re review, and I also have an interactive web platform where you can see the output to each stage of your code. So I think um, I, wish I should do a demo on this. Okay, so this is it. So you can actually access it. It's available on my GitHub. The code is there, and also the link to this web playground is also there. You can access it from my GitHub. So let's say you do, let's start with what we were doing before, x equal to 2 plus 8, and then you compile this. You can see the output of the Lexa is um, the token. It classifies the token. and this my compiler actually even tells you the location of your um, tokens. See the X is a variable token, the equal to is an assigned token, two is an integer, plus is um, this is an operator and this is an integer. Now we have the past three. So this is what the past three looks like. And we have the symbol table. There's only one variable here. So int and it's an integer. Then we have the code generation phase. So let's look at a more complicated. Um... Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're showing us something. You're trying to show us something, but we can't see it. We can't we see it. Oh, yes. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, give me a minute. Let me. Okay, can you see it now? Awesome, yeah, we can. Yeah, okay, so like I said, this is my web playground. You can access it via my GitHub profile. So I run the same example that I have on my slide, x equal to two plus eight, and I compiled it here. So you can see the output of the Lexica analyzer, and you can see that it classifies every token here. This is a variable, this is an assigned, this is an integer, and um, it gives you the past three, and you have your symbol table and you have your code generation. So if we want to go to, uh, let's try a deeper example. You have y is equal to, let's say this is a float. Um, So yeah, so this, uh, you can play around with it how you want. Like I said, it's an expression only compiler. It only handles expressions and nothing but expressions. But um, let's say we try to add two plus um, 7.9. Let's see what it will say. So you see, it says, um, it shows an error and says type mismatch because in my language, you can't add an integer and a uh, um, it floats at the same time. I don't allow that. Then let's say you try to do something like y is equal to z plus x. This shows an, another error saying the variable has not been defined. The variable in line 2 colon 5, and that's the z. z has not been defined in this code, and you're trying to use it. So with the help of the symbol table, my semantic analyzer was able to know that, OK, this variable has not been defined before. So um, I would leave a link to this on the chat, I think. And um, you're free to check it out. You're free to contribute to the code. And I mean, I'm looking to improve it to have um, if else statements and other um, keywords too. So I'm looking to improve it. So you can feel free to contribute and play around with it. And it helps you figure out how compilers work, basically. Yeah, so I also have the print statement, I think. Okay, let's say I misspelled this print and put this. 
you see so it says invalid program structure in line two column one so this prnt i missed the i here i misspelled it so it was my lexical analyzer in this stage that caught this error because this is an invalid token in my program it doesn't actually we don't have a word prnt uh, so yeah print works um, let's say i try to add semicolon i didn't define semicolon in my program so this should throw an error yeah unknown character at line two colon nine so this error is caught at the logical analysis stage because um colons are not allowed in my program so i would leave a link to this on the chat you can check out the code and play around with the compilers as much as you like All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for this amazing session. You really helped to meet my compilers, and I'm sure everyone had a great time. Thank you. So, attendees, we have connected VR spaces up next on stage by Dr. Eugene. So, go on there. Um, and, Jennifer, we have questions in the QA. So, okay. after this session, always go back there to reply each of the questions thank okay. you so much all right sure thank you